Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the um, seminar uh, entitled The Socratic Adventure of Plurality, Hannah Arendt and the Challenge of Philosophical Dialogue. Um, I will briefly present again our guest. Uh, changed from yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but there are some other people who oh, yeah, weren't present like. yesterday. Yeah. Thank you, Marian. Um, and then I will say uh, several words about the maybe text itself and then give the word to Matthias and then we will discuss together as we uh, used to do it here. So Matthias Bormuth holds the Chair of Comparative Intellectual History at Oldenburg University and runs the Karl, Karl Jaspers House. Uh, Professor Bormuth wrote on various very interesting personages, Gottfried Benn as the Bard of National Socialism, Levitt and Auerbach as Christian gentlemen, Ingeborg Bachmann as philosophen, philosopher, in addition to linking Jaspers with psychoanalysis and discovering suicidal thought of the 20th century. Among his other edited books, uh, in a format very similar, can I please take it? Uh, format very similar to our minima, edition minima, with one key text, introduction and the explanatory text, Bournemouth edited a book, Hannah Arendt, Socrates, Apologie der Pluralität, in 2016. Um, I will give two preliminary remarks. One is about love and the other is about the great philosophical zeal of Hannah Arendt um, as a way of introducing this text. So um, Arendt was definitely no stranger to thematizations of love. Her doctoral thesis was precisely about that. And there are some really famous passages on love as worldlessness in her human, human condition. But I would claim that in this text we find love towards Socrates the man and not the Socrates the philosopher or the sophos. Uh, I would even there say that throughout her text we may encounter some texts, some strange personal and even intimate uh, overtones. Well, this specific infatuation with Socrates can also be gleaned from her life of the mind, where he would be granted a key place in answering an old age question about what makes us think. What this essay shows is that Socrates has a special place within the major distinction which informed Arendt's work, action and thinking, or vita activa and vita contemplativa. The figure of Socrates is in its midst, but in an ambiguous way, blurring the boundaries which are otherwise so important to Arendt, which almost always happens with the ones we love. They confound us, and that is precisely what the citizen Socrates did in his many guises as, for example, a greyfish or a gadfly. Now, the second uh, remark, um, any ardent student of philosophy knows of the trials and tribulations Hannah Arendt here describes in this text. In other words, this essay is truly about the cornerstones in ancient Greek philosophy. However, what appears in reading Arendt's way of interpreting these cornerstones, sometimes appearing as if she had been a direct witness to Socrates' trial or Aristotle's flight from Athens, is basically sheer inventiveness, a rereading of a history which was told to us again in a completely novel way. And this novelty comes also from close reading, a uh, hermeneutics of sorts, because in her life of the mind, she points to the fact that the key parts of the sentence from Plato's Gorgias, which refers to this being one, has often been missing in translations, and which is also true for the Serbian translation of Gorgias. And as we know, she would build the whole philosophy around one such oft missing fragment of words. Now, even if Arendt was in the wrong, even if her interpretation strays from the truthful, whatever that means, of interpretation, that does not do injustice to the subject of her interpretation. Because her aim is not to interpret, but to invent something out of the moment she considers. There lies the true greatness of her thought, whether we agree with her or not, either philosophically or politically. Now I will, I will just give one paragraph, it's a long one, uh, but I think it's a very important one for the discussion today. Uh, it says, from, from the, the text we're going to discuss, 
We live today in a world in which not even common sense makes sense any longer. The breakdown of common sense in the present world signals that philosophy and politics, their old conflict notwithstanding, have suffered the same fate. And that means that the problem of philosophy and politics, or the necessity for a new political philosophy, from which could come a new science of politics, is once more on the agenda. If philosophers, despite their necessary estrangement from the everyday life of human affairs, were ever to arrive at a true political philosophy, they would have to make the plurality of men out of which arises the whole realm of human affairs in its grandeur and misery, the object of their Talmud Zayn. This is how the essay on Socrates, seemingly a new look on an old problem, ends. So do we still live in that same world where common sense makes, sense makes no sense any longer, or do we witness a possibly even greater loss of both commonness and sense? We are going to talk about common sense, at least in three uh, interventions today. Are we to ascribe to this idea, paradoxical and contested in many ways, that politics suffered a breakdown? I think that the last contribution will have to say something about this one. Do we have any answers in the many new political philosophies developed after Arendt that try to understand plurality better if and when they do? And can we, in a certain way, understand this essay as a call for more engaged thinkers in the world of human affairs, even if a trial of a sort still remains fatally attached to the destiny of one such call? So this, I hope, may be taken as a broad general framework for a discussion which could also provoke audience to take part in it. Now, Matthias, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me here. As I said yesterday, I'm not a specialist in philosophy. I'm somehow in between everything and always depending on the people who are specialists in the field. And so I take those two days here in Belgrade with you as philosophers as a chance to learn myself from your different positions on philosophy um, so that I might become smarter in my knowledge are and other things of Max Weber and as you know people are always the same so you will have the guy who talked about ambivalence yesterday it's also the guy who talks about ambivalence in Hannah Arendt and Socrates I think this topic of ambivalence <laughs> is for me very important especially when talking about social engagement and I will try to explain why I think so this introduction in this text is not an introduction in what I wrote or what Aaron wrote, it's just a try to attempt or an attempt to try to understand it in the way the talks until now here in Belgrade um, inspired me. So what is engagement? The life of the mind is for me a form of engagement, of inner engagement. And I think we as people who love philosophy should always think of this inner engagement as very important if we talk on the engagement in the social horizon. This is very important and I would say that Hannah Arendt is one of the most important philosophers who taught us what inner engagement could be and how to cultivate it in our life conduct. And that philosophy is not just theories and terms but the way of inner thinking. And this essay on Socrates, I would say, is one of the most important essays of Arendt, connected with the one in the life of the mind, where she talks about the ability and necessity of an inner thinking, and how this could be yeah, fulfilled in the tradition of Socrates. She herself, as the most of you know, was a race in the German university in the 1920s, and she chose to study with professors like Martin Heidegger, Karl Jaspers, Rudolf Goldbahn, who were at that time somehow against the Universitätsphilosophie, the philosophy of the academic standard. Although all of those three professors were somehow scholars, but they knew that thinking in theology and philosophy is something more than just being a scholar. And 
especially Heidegger and Jaspers were connected, they call it in German the Kampfgefährtenschaft, in doing something against this tradition of just building up theories and scholarly ideas. And I think we always have to keep this in mind when we think of Hannah Arendt, this origin of hers. And they call it in the 1920s the dialectical philosophy and dialectical theology. And those dialectical thinkers were someone who were saying, we always make compromises in the moral and theoretical life, and we are some of those who have to show that there's something beyond those compromises. And our thinking should be something different, should be thinking, das Nachdenken, das Denken. And this attempt to be different, to think about something which cannot be grasped totally, is somehow very important to understand the whole philosophy of Hannah Arendt. And it leads us to the core of this essay on Socrates. Because in this essay, she's somehow addicted to the platonic idea of something else, of the absolute, of the higher eternal ideas, and of a group of people she calls philosophers who are able to grasp, just as a few people, those ideas. But on the other side, she's also saying philosophy is something different. There's a tyranny of truth. There's no possibility to grasp those absolute eternal ideas the Socratic way. And <coughs> as far as I can say from my reading, I would be interested how you read this essay. She doesn't solve the problem. You can say there's a certain ambivalence in Arendt, taking at certain points the platonic standpoint and being addicted to it and fascinated by it, and at other passages the Socratic standpoint, and in third passages attempts to connect both in a certain way. So what we can say, we have this platonic tradition in Hannah Arendt, which was somehow built up in the 1920s, with, starting with Jaspers, Heidegger and Bultmann, and you have the Socratic tradition in her, and both cannot be harmonized totally. And the interesting question is how she deals with it and what we can learn out of it. And on the one side, as I was saying, she stresses the platonic idea of absolute truth and she does it by telling the myth of the cave. And she tells it in a totally different way than Max Weber told this myth. For Max Weber, as a historicist, it was clear that ideas have just a pragmatic function, or historical ideas, without any eternal horizon anymore. And for Arendt, in the Platonic way of reading the myth of the cave, there is still the possibility of eternal ideas, and of those who are able to grasp and to understand them at least. There is the philosopher who can make his way out of the cave and adopt to the light of the sun and see the sun. And the great problem is for this philosopher how to tell the people in the dark and how not to become irritated when going back into the dark. And in her essay on Heidegger's 80th or 70th birthday in no, 70th birthday in, in 1969, she's talking about him like a platonic philosopher who is somehow the one who's able to have those ideas, but while living in the dark of the worldly circumstances is irritated. And in this way you will see that somehow this essay also, it's written in 1954, it's already an apology of those philosophers, who are platonic philosophers, and try to adopt their ideas in worldly circumstances and somehow get confused or draw wrong decisions. So this is the one side. And the other side is the Socratic side where she's clearly saying and uh, referring to the trial and the person of Socrates, there is no chance of having um, somehow absolute idea of the truth we only have opinions. And this is throughout the essay, I think about 10, 15 times said, every, tr uh, every tr truth turns to opinion in the moment we 
we try to tell it. So this is somehow the Socratic point. She's saying somebody can try to understand an eternal truth, but when he starts thinking and talking about it, it becomes a certain opinion of this person connected to his historical standpoint, to his person. And um, this we have to keep in mind um, that she is somehow taking both positions and trying to harmonize them a little bit. Um, so you could um, resume, there's on the one side the philosophical mind who can leave the cave and experience, as she's saying, the pathos of the wonder, the taumatse in Greek, the enthusiasm of grasping eternal ideas. And we have then, secondly, the common people, and that's important for Arendt here, the common people could grasp those ideas. They could leave the cage, but they do not want to. That's her uh, explanation here in this essay, because they do not want to live with those ideas. They do not want to think. They do not want to live a thought for life. So her later idea of thoughtlessness is somehow uh, seen in this essay already. So the common people could be able to leave the cave, could somehow have certain philosophical ideas of higher truth, but they fear to think. They fear this life of thinking as something which is out of the normal conditions, which is somehow stressing them and um, taking too much of their time. Though, and only those few who are able to live a thoughtful life are the ones who are important for the philosophy. Um, and that's the second point. And the third one is uh, that the philosophical mind, even, he, even if he wants to live this thoughtful life, um, is always um, drawn to the insight that his thoughtful thinking will end up in opinions, in opinions of a great plurality. And if you focus a little bit more this idea of plurality or signature of plurality, how Arendt calls it, um, it's twofold. On the outside, you have the plurality in the society. You have all the people with all the opinions. And for Arendt, is, it is important that those people with the different opinions meet in certain circles. And for her political uh, philosophy, for example, in her early essay on the Hungarian Revolution or in her book on the American Revolution, you can see how fascinated she was from the institutions of small circles. Small circles where people meet and try to solve their political questions in those small democratic circles. Räte in German, she was saying. And this idea goes back to Rosa Luxemburg. So in this way, the idea of sharing opinions, sharing a plurality of opinions is connected to the idea of Räte, of small circles in a certain democratic um, field and the example of the Hungarian Revolution in 1956 and the historical example of the American Revolution where somehow idle types of Arendt's concept of possible outer dialogue and coming together with different opinions and trying to find out how those different opinions could be transformed into a political opinion which could be lived by. But this outer way of handling plurality in a form of a dialogue is connected to an inner dialogue. And this essay in Socrates is much more uh, concentrated on the question how can we lead this inner dialogue? What could and what should we do to have the inner dialogue uh, in our solitude? And the, the important thing is that Arendt, we touched it yesterday a little bit, is saying if we lead this inner dialogue with ourselves, we recognize very clearly that we are more than one, we are two in one. And even those two in one somehow discuss a plurality of possible opinions. And her idea is 
a little bit different from the idea of Max Weber. She's gaining or she's trying to say there should be a possibility how to come to coherent position as a person. And the first, um, the first um, way to come to a coherent uh, opinion is she's talking about like an inner drive, an ethical need of the person because uh, she is referring to Socrates and his idea of being coherent as a person on the one side and on the other side of Socrates saying that nobody wants to live with a murderer. So this inner ethical drive of Socrates to be somehow coherent in your inner opinions and in the extreme not to want to live with someone who did something like a murder. Some. This for Arendt could be the inner motivation to try not to stay in a plurality of possible standpoints but to come to a coherent point. This is the one drive. And the other drive she's talking about is the social drive. Is like talking here or talking in a greater public or talking in a political circle that everybody who talks with other people <laughs> is somehow forced to develop a certain opinion. So on the outside we might in a discussion appear as persons with a coherent idea because we want to talk with other ones, because we want to do something. So we have to decide in what we want to talk and say and in what we want to do with other ones. And this social force or enforcement of coming together, of doing and thinking together, somehow can develop um, a certain coherence of a person, at least on the outside. This is some of the second point she's saying, or the possibility of how we can overcome our inner plurality. But now this would be my question at this point. Isn't it possible, and when could it be possible, to develop a position of ambivalence, of staying plural and clearing up on the outside? Isn't this a possibility too? And I would say yes in certain circumstances. I would say we need a clear position of ambivalence too. And society needs it. That people are able to claim for themselves and other ones the possibility of being not coherent, of struggling still with different positions in ourselves. That this could be a possible aim of social and inner engagement, learning how to stay ambivalent on the outside, confessing to others. I do not know. I might think this, I might think that. Both things are interesting and possible and I am not decided what I should take. And for me, out of my experience, I would say in academic life, you find a good teacher who is somehow showing his students indirectly or directly how to stay ambivalent, how not to solve problems, how to be able to live with unsolved problems, with unanswered questions. This could be, for me, in certain circumstances, be a great social engagement to show how ambivalence as an attitude or a reality is something we have and can live with. And that somehow sharing these ambivalences is something different from just having ambivalences. That in the status of sharing this ambivalence, something happens. And nevertheless, and this is typical for Hannah Arendt, she knows about the pragmatic need that we decide sometimes. We have always to decide. We have to draw decisions. And I think this connection between allowing ambivalence and talking about it, and on the other side, seeing very clearly that sometimes things have to be decided, but that the decision we draw might be one out of ambivalence, and not a clear one. This is something we can learn from Hannah Arendt as necessary. 
and this is somehow in the text too, I would say. So for me, this essay on Socrates is somehow a master essay on ambivalence. And I would like to share this thought with you later and have your opinions on this essay in this regard too. And on the other side, this essay, whenever I read it, um, is an essay which refreshes my inner need to start thinking. Whenever I read this essay, I'm just not making up ideas and theories. I start being somehow impressed by the words of Hannah Arendt on Socrates, wanting to know what is this inner life? What is this pathos of wonder? This tomatze, this enthusiasm. There's something in the essay which I think touches everybody who wants to become a philosopher and wants to do more than just making up theories. And I think this is an important task of philosophy to provide essays and texts which are somehow refreshing our inner interest and engagement in thinking as such. And at certain points in the essay, Hannah Arendt is saying very clearly the philosophical mind is someone who likes to think about, quen about questions which have no answers. And I would say this is fantastic. Um, and I would say this connects philosophy very closely to literature. And if you read, for example, the collection of essays by Hannah Arendt, Min in Dark Times, you see that she was also attracted by many writers, poets, Walter Benjamin, Bertolt Brecht, Winston H. Orden, Lessing. So we have in Hannah Arendt also a tradition of reading literature in a certain way. And I want to end my introduction um, by asking with you what could be the function of literature and the philosophy of Hannah Arendt, just a small hint. And therefore it's, it's interesting to look also back in the history of her teachers that Jaspers, Heidegger, um, especially, were touched by the literature of Friedrich Hölderlin. In 1913-14, there was a new edition of the works of Hölderlin out of the Georges Circle in Heidelberg by Norbert von Hellingrad. And they especially were talking about the late poems of Hölderlin. And one poem, Brot und Wein, Bread and Wine, was a decisive poem which Heidegger was using in the 1930s to somehow explain or be inspired by the poem to, to develop his philosophy. And there's one uh, line, one verse in this poem where it's the famous question, what are poets good for in poor times? And I love this, this quotation, and I don't love what Heidegger made out of it, but it's a very clear question, what are poets good for in poor times? And I think poets, like philosophers, are those in poor times who keep up the questions. And if you look a little bit closer on Hannah Arendt herself, you can see that she read poems and literature like this in this way of the Hölderlin readings of the Taumatze and the Pathos of Wonder, of Last Questions. But she also read poems and literature in the way of getting to know the concrete life of persons. And there's one writer, one German writer, she was very closely connected to, called Uwe Jonsson. I don't know who of you have ever read Uwe Jonsson. He's in Germany, one of the most famous writers of the 20th century. And he read a four volume called Anniversary, Jahrestage. And this book from the early 1930s goes to the late 1960s. And for Arendt, this book was so important, she even sent it to Heidegger because of Jonsson's ability to collect time and the experiences of men in the literature. And I would say, whenever we talk of the opinion of people and of standpoints of people, we have to see that those standpoints are somehow pictured in literature. And that our need to read literature in order to understand our own standpoints and the standpoints of others is very important. So as philosophers, one is somehow tempted to stay in abstract thinking, 
and this is fine. But on the other side, literature is a very important tool for the philosopher to understand concrete standpoints and concrete opinion making in historical times. And so therefore, Hannah Arendt was on the one side one who was reading poems like the poems of Hölderlin, and she was reading realistic literature like the literature of Uwe Jonsson, trying to show how the experience of reality what was for certain people in Germany over four decades. And the third function for literature for Arendt was, as she was saying in the famous essay on Lessing, to give a, somehow um, expression of the tragic experience of life. So our inability to answer questions sometimes can be connected by the attempt at least to try to give a certain literature or the literary expression to the experience people are making. And therefore literature has this important function of yeah, giving a tragic expression to life. So closing up my short introduction, I want to refer uh, to you writer here, Danilo Kish, we met the widow yesterday and uh, connecting one sentence of his with my interest in ambivalence. And Kish said in one interview very clearly that the only form or the only way to bring, to bring integrity to our life is by literature. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Um, well, not only that uh, Hannah Arendt <coughs> is not interpreting uh, well, so to say, but when we read Hannah Arendt, then we also have our own interpretations, which differ very much. Uh, you haven't mentioned the political, I think, none. <laughs> What's political? Exactly. Well, that's also my question, but I always pose it to myself after reading the rent even more. Uh, well, but this is something interesting how we see one short text very differently. I will, I will just one thing now, which is not a common thing, but I want to introduce you with the people who are sitting here only in one, one very short reference. Who, so uh, we're we're beginning with Olga Nikolic. Uh, she's a philosopher working with phenomenology, Husserl and polit um, political philosophy, prefigurative politics. Želko uh, Radinkovic is our German philosopher and our German speaker. He deals with Heidegger and hermeneutics. Djurja Knežević is a Latin American scholar. She works... I'm, I'm very sorry. Djurja Trajković. Djurja Trajković. Sorry. Uh, is Latin American scholar. She works with literature, so we will have literature at this table. And uh, she works with Rancière as well, very much. Uh, Sandy Milutinovic Boyanic is a philosopher, um, uh, works with many things, and um, right now with Marianne Weber, and I think you would like that, uh, but also very much with gender theory, feminist theory and queer theory and French philosophers. Uh, Monica Cano Abadia, uh, she's also a philosopher, uh, also working with the newer feminist political philosophies, for example, uh, Judith Butler and um, Rosie Braidotti, and Srđan uh, Prodanović, what happens when you say, uh, Srđan Prodanović, who's a sociologist, uh, the, in the way the Weber is also a philosopher, uh, so he works Thanks with <laughs> he works with pragmatism, common sense, and his contribution would be in that in that field as well. And uh, Igor Zweig, who's a philosopher, who works with Kant and um, affects, motions, and all these tricky things. <laughs> yes. So now that I uh, introduce all of them. Uh, we will start with the politics and the friendship with um, uh, Olga, and then continue with Monica, for which maybe uh, make, maybe we could have two interventions, and then you, if you want to talk, and then two interventions. Is that okay? No. No? <laughs> Good, Monica. 
Thank you. Um, so you mentioned in your introduction that uh, analyzing this text will oscillate between Socratic and Platonic position. The Platonic side question that she's in more towards the Socratic uh, position and the application of Doxa as opposed to this Platonic position. Uh, Um, so, I will start with uh, this concept of doxa uh, because that's one of the things that I find very interesting in this text. Um, uh, as opposed to the Platonic tradition, the doxa is understood as a mere opinion. Aaron here reveals another meaning of doxa as I quote, comprehension of the world as it opens itself to me. Uh, this is the quote from the text. And uh, I think this idea can be connected with the phenomenological notion of perspective as a unique point of view that each person has. A particular standpoint from which the world is disclosed to us based on our unique and our living experience. Thus, a perspective involves not only this or that we do about something, but the entire web of meaning we use to make sense of our own. Uh, and this, this individual perspectives necessarily also lack with those of other people because we live together and share and have the same world. So we share some of our meanings with some others, other meanings with other others. Uh, we share language, knowledge, values, goals, etc. And in this overlapping, plural overlapping of perspective, plural perspectives, a common road is quite on many levels of universality. So, uh, on starting from the level of sharing something with the other person to the level of sharing something with members of, uh, of a broader community uh, where we live. Uh, so, uh, here comes the first question. Uh, in light of your le lecture yesterday, the conclusion of your lecture, I would like to ask about the truth that is revealed in talking through opinions with others. Uh, namely, what kind of truth is that? Because in the text there is ambivalence that puzzled me. Uh, maybe we should simply affirm the ambivalence, I'm not sure. Um, so, Arendt says it's not merely subjective truth for me, but neither is it uh, objective in Plato's sense of absolute truth. So, what is the status of this truth? What makes it uh, true? Um, now, second, my second point is that I would like to comment on the role of dialogue in the text. Um, that I understood as a specific form of active sharing of perspectives, which requires a relation of mutual openness, uh, such as we find in friendship. Namely, in dialogue, I should be open to speaking to you, but also to listen, open to listen to you, which is not always the case in conversation. Thus, in dialogue, we become acquainted with others' perspective, and this influences our perspective and vice versa. The opinion of a friend, if they disagree with me, is likely to make me rethink my own perspective, my own opinion, uh, or if we are in agreement to somehow confirm or validate my opinion. Um, so that is how I see that we come to share perspectives in a twofold way. First, we are talking about our opinions, so I'm sharing my perspective with, with, uh, with you but also um, parts of your perspective become parts of mine, so that there are some meanings now that we have in common. <coughs> um, so my second question is, uh, how can such dialogue, the example of which we find in Socrates, uh, of, in Arendt's description of Socrates, um, which, is, which is, as I see, the very personal relation between the two, can help us reinvent politics, where we have much greater plurality of perspectives. And you mentioned something that also came to, to my mind. Uh, so uh, grassroots, uh, small circles, uh, democratic, uh, local movements where we 
uh, where this this can actually this dialogue mm -hmm. can actually take place. Um, but these uh, always have such difficulties to enter the sphere of, of official politics. So, um, on, so are they always? Uh, <coughs> uh, do, do they always have to stay on the margins of official politics? Um, and uh, on the other hand, uh, persuasion, more than dialogue, seems to dominate the, the relation of politicians towards the public and strategic <coughs> interest more than friendship in what we today call political dialogue between officials. Uh, so, what is your comment on the role of dialogue and friendship in politics? Mm -hmm. That's my second question, and uh, I will conclude with that. Okay, so, do you agree with the conclusion of the two questions, and then, or would you like to answer? If I get your question right, I should answer now. <laughs> 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 I, yes, I could. Um, First, I like the questions on how you were developing your thoughts. I think um, I could um, say uh, I would uh, ask the same questions. Um, and I think that's one of the good things about Aaron that some things stay unclear. And that the question you were raising, the first one, what is the status of truth? I'm not sure. One thing I could say is that somehow the platonic horizon in the background and somehow the idea that everybody who wants to develop an opinion should be somehow touched by the platonic experience. So that a person who thinks about opinions in the world should be one who has experienced platonic ideas, should be a philosopher. And, that, and because of the contrast, yeah? So whenever we have opinions, we have at least a contrast of a certain platonic idea, whatever this is. And I think this, this, this unclearness yeah, um, is one of the best points in Arendt. And it might be um, insufficient for someone who wants to have a clear, rational answer. Yeah? But I think Hannah Arendt, especially for this unclearness, yeah, an openness of the way she's writing about these things stays one of the most mostly read philosophers. Um, because nobody will solve this question. Yeah? And I'm not sure what happens if we once have solved this question. Yeah? If we know what is the status of truth, what, what happens then? So is it necessary to answer this question? What happens to us if we know? And isn't it more important somehow to be in this unclearness between this platonic viewpoint, which is somehow in our mind still, in this realistic knowledge that all we can have is a form of opinion? But I start to repeat myself. Um, um, can I just, uh, uh, so um, when we're talking about uh, this uh, striving towards platonic mm -hmm. uh, ideals. Uh, I remember the preface uh, of the book where uh, there is a, mm, a long uh, quote or just a short preface, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, Arendt says that uh, we should keep striving for the ideal, but we, um, but if we try to articulate it and to say now it's reached, then we end up in despotism. So. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's wonderful. And I could underline. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, and the second one, um, uh, I think one point uh, how it could be successful is, I would say those grassroots things might sometimes enter the public life of politics on the one side, so it's not hopeless, yeah? Um, and then, it sometimes could be the case that public politicians, uh, politicians always public, uh, that politicians somehow are connected to philosophers, and that philosophers sometimes may have a certain influence 
or that politicians may read a book. Um, this is somehow a question of how they are trained. In Germany at the time, you can see that many politicians are those who do not succeed in other, in other pro professions. Huh? So we, you, you have like a, a light of people who somehow didn't succeed in becoming something else. Huh? And this is not an, a nice thing. So the question is, how could a light of politicians could be trained? Is there a possibility? Or is this profession of politician something uh, yeah, where only people nowadays um, go to or, or, or take this, this way who do not succeed in anything else? Yeah? And you have your own experiences here, I think. Yeah? Um, well, I could not say more about okay, it. Okay, okay, thanks. And the other day when we had a brief conversation, Adriana and me, about how to prepare this, we were thinking that it's so beautifully written, this text, that one wonders what to add to this because what it's... Reading. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but you're right when you said that this essay refreshes the inner need of engagement in thinking, but also to me, um, uh, it refreshed the interest in engaging with others at the same time. And something struck me when I was reading this, because it was um, when she was talking about post-Pericles Athens, it was as if Arendt was talking about today. And she was talking about Maieutic as a political activity um, that requires dialogue that is shared by friends. And so I'm linking it with your question. Um, and politics as making friends, as making small circles as you said, um, finding a common ground through discussion and dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I quote her, Socrates tried to make friends with Athens' citizenry, but the context didn't allow it. And I quote again, Inten there was intense and uninterrupted contest of all against all, and ceasingly showing oneself to be the best of all. And that makes me think immediately of our neoliberal, technologically mediated mm -hmm. times. So this context in Athens, but now also, didn't allow dialogue or finding common grounds, sharing with friends. And I quote her, she says, it made alliances between them well nigh impossible. And this made me think about the concept by Peter Mayo of misplaced alliances. He wrote in a, in a book about Gramsci about the um, Gramscian concept of solidarity between the North and the South. He writes about these misplaced alliances between subaltern groups and their oppressors. And these misplaced alliances um, are reproduced nowadays because it's, mm, it's made impossible to make alliances with friends. We don't share common ground with friends anymore. And we are gladly following the neoliberal invitations to make alliances with the enemy, so to speak, and forget our fellow citizens. And Erin continues also when she is um, characterizing these times on envy, that she says it's the national vice of ancient Greece. And envy, of course, nowadays with Instagram and Facebook, it's, it's very much a characteristic of our times. So all these um, characteristics are, for her, uh, impeding engagement with others. Mm -hmm. And today the commonness of the, of the political world is neither experienced between citizens. So my, all my questions are on the side of engagement. So how to reconstruct this common political world, how to share politics with friends again, how to make friends mm -hmm. even in these times mm. of hypermediated, disconnected individualism, mm -hmm. how to share the sameness of the world that reminds us that, and I quote her, both you and me are human. And this makes me think, of course, of, of Judith Butler. Everything mm -hmm. make, takes me to Judith Butler about the, the common shared human vulnerability. The and common? Shared uh, human vulnerability, mm -hmm. how we are all equally vulnerable, and mm -hmm. both you and me are human, mm -hmm. and we kind of mm -hmm. forget about that. Mm -hmm. uh, we need reminders of uh, that common shared vulnerability. 
um, and how to share the sameness of the world, especially when sharing one's vision of the sameness of the world requires to be, and I quote her, able to show oneself, to be seen and heard by others. So again, vulnerability, which requires to expose ourselves. But nowadays, it seems that the, the doxa, arena, is mediated by algorithms, and we share our opinions in social media, which are at the same time hyper-exposed places, mm -hmm. and places that allow some hiding, but not nurture solitude. Mm -hmm. So there's this tension mm -hmm. also. Um, uh, they don't nurture inner dialogue. So how then, with all this, um, how do we share together? That would be mm. my yes. questions. Um, I think in talking or in providing your questions, it's, it's wonderful because one sees the need of friendship yeah, in our times. And I think the diagnosis on the time is excellent. Yeah? And, and the point is, it's a negative diagnosis. Yeah? And the point is, uh, for me, when do we make positive experiences with other people? Like I think um, people can only um, leave the social media if they have positive experiences with people. If there's enough, if we do not feel the need of going to the social media. And where are places where people can make those experiences? Starting in school or starting with certain teachers at the university or, or private friends. So I think it's somehow the question, are there still places in, in the society, in the um, uh, way of becoming someone through school, through university, of making friends, real friends? And my experience, if you once made real friends, you know what quality is. And, and you will always feel, also you're attracted by other media, what quality is. But you once have to experience it. Even the same with reading books, yeah? You can talk, we can talk about reading books and literature, but having once made the experience of what the book could be is necessary. And this would be my answer, like, or well, my question. I'm questioning too, yeah? I had some friends at school, at university, then I had the luck of being out of any discipline and I was writing to old professors, yeah? Uh, from philosophy, psychiatry, literature, and started visiting them, yeah? People 70, 75, 80. And those people, like those old guys, they showed me what a conversation with the old professor could be. And this openness of, this, of these old people, yeah? Is until now very precious to me. So it's very interesting that because of our social life and academic life, normally, Everybody under 65 is busy. Like experience, experiencing people who have somehow the, the interest and the passion for, for real conversations, huh? where do we find them? Um, and the envy in academic life. Yeah? We talked about it yesterday, yeah? showing off how smart we are. Yeah? And this is so stupid. In Germany nowadays, everybody wants to be smart and show how much he or she knows. But the point is in academic life, smartness is a ground condition. Yeah? We have to know something. And then we are interested in our field. And at a certain point, the idea of showing off should vanish. Yeah? And starting to discuss because we have the same problems and questions. And I would say, like you were talking about um, vulnerability. Yeah? It's a wonderful and serious word. Yeah? Everybody is somehow a person with certain inner questions, irritations, and to accept each other and to be interested in, in a person with a certain way of being vulnerable. Um, Jasper was, for example, up working about artists who are vulnerable, like Van Gogh, Nietzsche, Hölderlin. And the interesting thing is, for my opinion, that sometimes people who are vulnerable have the, the passion and the inner need to overcome it and the talent to do. And, the, and I think sometimes vulnerability could be a gift. 
because people who are not vulnerable or who are able to, to somehow adopt to the social life very smart never experience something which Jaspers called border situations. Yeah? And I think sometimes situations could be very necessary where we know we have no other possibility than sticking to it and somehow trying to overcome it. And this is something not always. Yeah? People can, can die because they live in cruel situations, but sometimes it can help at least. And I would think most important or, or the greatest danger nowadays is that we are too easy to move. I can do this and that and it starts too early. I think it's a great privilege to choose, yeah? But there should be a time where we somehow understand who we are, what our questions are. And only then we can choose. And only then we can really move. And if we start to move too early, we will become people who are great in languages, who, who can adopt to this and that very quickly, but they lose their own questions. And I, like my experience is with people uh, who, who are raised at the universities now and who are in business, in many fields, even philosophy, huh, are very quick, are very able to do this and that, to adopt to this and that. Uh, but, but they don't have an inner question anymore. They are smart, they can answer, they can talk to you four languages, but something is missing. Yeah? And so I think my question would be, how could we come to certain inner resistances through which we have to live and in which we have to have friends with whom we share those times? Um, but I have no answer. Uh, I just can say it's attractive, yeah? And the other thing is, or the last thing is, um, friendships seem to be very authentic, yeah? But m my experience with Hannah Arendt is that she was somehow, and she was a great friend of many different people. But friendship always means too that we still are wearing a mask. So we never can be authentic, yeah? There are just some moments in life where we can be authentic. So even in friendships, we have to learn to, to wear a mask, to, to behave to this person different than we have to be to the other one. This is somehow a form of culture. And the idea of authentic lives in friendship, from my understanding, uh, is wrong. We are never authentic. We always live through a cultural social mask. And the task is to learn to be personal through this mask, at least a bit, and to find people who understand my language. Because everybody needs somehow to be for him or herself. And in close contact, uh, yeah, it's not possible, or only seldom. Just a little question. I didn't understand you when you said that Jaspers talked about vulnerable situations. How did he call them? About border situations? Border. Yeah, border situations okay. are those in which uh, our normal pattern of behavior and thinking isn't working anymore. So we are somehow forced to invent something new. And those could be very helpful in life. Okay, thank you. No? I just wanted to add a very different thought uh, for me. As far as I understand, what are the most important moments in this meditation is this understanding that the two image uh, narrative about self knowledge and that uh, recognition of material vulnerability is possible only when I recognize myself mm -hmm. as always vulnerable. You know, and that's why it's important to with mm -hmm. the world that if I don't understand myself more and more, I just take opinions that I get on the mm -hmm. internet, then I, I wouldn't recognize how it should. Mm -hmm. yeah, Thank all, you. All the time in the border situation, I'm not going to do it.
Uh-huh. So I prepared a little um, intervention. And so here is, a, I'm going to read something that I wrote because I was just playing with the text a little bit. Playing with the text. I'm playing with the text. Um, what precedes politics and what is the condition and possibility of politics today at the beginning of a new millennium? Hannah Arendt in the 1950s, when she's writing her book in other, uh, rather ungenerous readings of her writings, has been accused of nostalgic return to the ancient Greeks and aestheticism. One can say that while it is true that nostalgia and aestheticism are at the heart of our own thinking, she's correct to dissociate politics from an instrumentalization, but never the la- fast. Oh, I'm sorry. I get everything. So she is correct to dissociate politics from any instrumentalization, but nevertheless empties it out of any content, leaving it formal and formalized in the self-disclosure of singularities. But this claim in itself harbors a secret relation between politics and aesthetics. To put it in other words, politics is aesthetics in principle, since there can be no creation, hence disclosure of self without fiction, that is, without the possibility of literature, aesthetics, and alternative sense. Feeling without knowing, listening without understanding, and experiencing something new. What would happen if we said that the goal of politics is not only action and bringing something new into being, but forging nonviolent stories of relationality and sociality, friendship and trust without guarantee of a return, hmm. generosity, and assuming responsibility, depth, and futurity where previously there were none. This would require not any more strictly speaking philosophers, politicians, sociologists, or whatever discipline you can name. In our post-theory epoch, not over, but after the golden age of theory of the 80s and 90s, it would be a thinking of community of readers, writers, and thinkers as a bit unfamiliar, strange, strange, lateral, a bit like Socrates himself. Writer relates and forges new relations. To write is to open relations with others from the past and others of the future. The text is that relation, the construction of family in a community, not a bloody institution of a bloodline, but is an antigenetic genealogy. Reader reads, he or she promulgates a difference between this or that, between who and what, who is human and what is identity. Common sense and consensus, thus identity without human, seek agreement without discord, politics without aesthetics, meaning without sensibility. In other words, poiesis is not political rather than aesthetic, because it is never political enough. It never gets over the aesthetics. When we can no longer make distinction between sensibilities, say, between calculative thinking and uh, poetic thinkers of the question of humanness, that access an uncommon element is another possibility of being with others, this will spell the absolute death of politics, or it will be politics reduced to the battles of interest and struggle for meaning. For nothing matters, indeed nothing would matter, if we no longer can tell the difference between living a good love, worthy of its name, on one hand, and the production or reproduction of one and the same on the other. These two last notions are the common sense of political philosophy today. Meaning or interest, choose one, which means you cannot have either. Today politics survives barely as a disagreement between sensibilities and senses. And this is why Jacques Rancière, who dissociates equality from general equivalence, that is money, will say that a human is not a rational animal, but a literary animal, for only humans are capable of nonsense and stupid fear of the other. For when men and women come together, and they come today rarely, they chit-chat, quarrel, make friendships, rivalries, laugh, share loss and death, exchange ecstasy and multiplicity, and in doing so, they share the universal we call humanity, the part of no part, and pass on the difference the human is. This coming and leaving, coming and going, the breaking up and going, joining, the assembling of affects, is where politics emerges as a rhythm between bodies, something akin to unusual dance of impure happiness. This is why contemporary discussions on biopolitics and cognitives are crucial today. Thus, it is not a surprise why Arden goes to Socrates is but one of many figures of politics, for what she's nostalgic for is not his smartness or intelligence, but his sensibility. But who is Socrates within Arendt's scene of writing? Let's imagine a reader who has never heard of Socrates. The figuring of the figure of Socrates as a thinker is what is at stake in Arendt's difficult and complex writing. Socrates, an idiot in the family, a body of work that refuses to be consumed and disappear. Arendt's Socrates is an allegory of a limited experience of language. In truth, only exposure to the limit, the non-object and the non-subject that bind the two, 
can lead to an engagement with an other, to an ethics and politics of alterity. A limit or border exists when another appears beyond the self, pointing up to a single fact that self is not all. Another emerges only when the self exhausts itself, goes to the limit, but finds that there is still more, something and someone beyond its appropriation and objectification, something other that is self-concerned, but outside its domain. The event of Socrates, then, is the event of language. Language renames the relation between exposure to the other and grammar. And yet Socrates, in his weakness and his quietness, can speak, but the question is whether he can communicate. Communication, that is relation of himself to the other, requires an access, an extra we call language. Dialogue is not only dialogue between the two, but also in space and time of that relation, which is relative to the waste of time, given the condition of capitalism. Language is the subject's doing and undoing, and this is why Socrates fails, not because he was not per persuasive enough, no amount of seduction and persuasion can do that, but because he turned the event of language into questioning and into method. Language turned into a tool via right and then a possession, into habitus, soil, land, being non-artificial self-reflection. To be sure, there can be no communication without style, mood, tone, and rhythm. And yet, since there are no measures, hence norms, for style, mood, and tone, hence literature, one could reprimand the child for using a tone, and yet all articulations could in a tone. What Socrates' performance allowed for is the description of the incalculable beat into the performance itself, the non-coincidence of two performances which we call heterogeneity of style. Socrates' performance then marks a fragile surplus that consensus and common sense strive to annihilate. And so here we come to my question, which is very simple. What do we do with the problem of language today in our global world? Yeah. Global world. Yeah, thank you. This was a very fast performance <laughs> of, of language and thoughts with many striking keywords. And as far as I understood, um, I think it was another form of of, of repeating this essay somehow and being touched by the essay. Um, um, you were asking what do we do with language in our global world? We read those essays or we talk to each other. And um, I think it's somewhat connected to, to what, what you were saying in our world where, where we are often counted and absorbed by social media, yeah? and there's no ability of concentration anymore. I see with many of my students yeah? in the seminars, <coughs> texting in between, reading, yeah? and 95% of the texts are not necessary. Yeah? So the question is, are we able to be for ourselves long enough without having unnecessary messages? Are we able to wait for, for moments for a real exchange of language and thoughts? Um, and I think this is only possible for people who have had that quality, who can wait. Like if I know what a real conversation is, I really do not need to have every five minutes another uh, Facebook message in my account. I don't need it. It's too much. And the point is, why don't we try to stop it? This is like, you're looking, but many people who are, who are working in this field, and many who are somehow, and that's the point, many who are like engineering it, yeah? And constructing it for themselves don't use it because of this inability to concentrate anymore, to discern what's important and what is not important. And even the emails are like I'm overwhelmed with emails, yeah. And this is enough for me, yeah. So I never started with Facebook. I have enough of my emails. And the question is, do we have the inner ability to wait for for moments of quality talk? And do we have people with whom we can have those talks? Um, this is the point. And I'm convinced. Only people who have this idea of equality can say, I don't want it anymore. Otherwise, we are somehow addicted. Or sometimes we need it yeah, for some social events and things. But why don't stop it for some hours? Yeah? 
And I myself have to tell, using the internet, yeah? When I try to write, I have to say, okay, from 8 to 11, I don't look into my emails, I don't surf, I write. And it's hard. It was easier in earlier times without the internet, yeah? So, and it's a, it's a question of ascesis, yeah? Of concentrating on things which are really important. And I think, um, how can we uh, choose things which are really important for us in moments and, 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 and be so frank to say, I do not want to be connected to everybody. I don't have to. I cannot uh, make something out of it. It's, it's no use. Um, so somehow it's, it's, it's a question of beginning to concentrate and having quality experiences in language, uh, with reading things or talking to people. And I'm convinced it's still possible, as far as I can say. But it needs to be communicated and people need, like at this place here, other places, to have the chance to, to exchange thoughts with people on a certain level of a certain level of trust, of openness, of vulnerability, of not just academic talk. And it depends somehow on the people who are, who are creating those places, on their ability to, to create trust, an atmosphere of trust. Or one can create an atmosphere of showing off, yeah? who is the best here. Yeah? But it's so boring at the end. Yeah? And I think if people understand how boring it is to compete always, Knowing everybody is somewhere on a certain level, yeah? Otherwise, you wouldn't have access, yeah? But then we really try to share problems, questions. <coughs> and not just like in sports, who's the best, yeah? But this is somehow depending on people and places, and one just can hope for people who are able to create places without this competition thing. It's very hard and normally doesn't succeed very often, yeah? Uh, and Hannah Arendt, I think, she was very smart in the way that she was being in between many different, many circles, yeah? not just in one. She was at universities, she had her private places, she had some social uh, yeah, places where she met other people, and I think she had a certain economics of, 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 of creating quality places. Yeah? Um, and she still was part of this old university thing of meeting professors, of exchanging real letters over years, decades, of meeting friends, not seeing them for half a year and then have a talk for three or four hours. So this is somehow a culture of, of, of conversation, I think, which is not lost. And it's up to us to, to recreate it and to refresh it as fast as we can. And not just making great concepts, just starting. And one point could really be uh, to stop, to have too many social connections, yeah? That's the death. <coughs> well, I mean it. We all feel connected, but for what reason, yeah? You lose yourself being connected to too many people. How many is enough? Five. <laughs> I don't know. I but told you say that uh, the enough number is some, somewhere in between 150 and 180. That is basically uh, our biological limit to uh, our cognitive capacity to socialize. Mm. Hunter gatherer limit. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Mm. But actually, the, the, the experiment has been repeated. Uh, several times after uh, the English anthropologists were being done by the Friday for the first time with such a community, and it has been repeated with, uh, with social networks. 
And uh, again and again, the same result appears. Only the, the exact number varies in the kind of fish in terms of the name. Well, this includes both close friends and acquaintances yes. and like the yeah. whole universe or something. Yeah, and like the, the lady who works in your local uh, uh, grocery store, you know, whether you are capable of noticing that she has a floor now. But, okay, sorry. Thanks. Yeah, just, just a very cool. Don't you find social networks and the romantic attention which comes with social networks to be a form of non social domination? Of social domination is a deliberate policy which has created a world of experience in which, like it or not, you cannot escape a fragmentation of attention. Mm -hmm. Labor to major problems of children with so called ADH, level D, the chronic benefits of the soul. Mm -hmm. When I was young, this was called restless child children. Mm -hmm. Now it's called uh, uh, attention deficit disorder. Yeah. It's being to the antipsychotics. Uh, so we have a problem which is socially conditioned, and then we define the medical problems. Mm -hmm. And it's treated as a medical problem. We have the same problem. We have a cognitive deficit. In relation to what it requires, uh, I myself also find myself in a situation where if I have to deal with a cognitive issue, with a cognitive problem, I have an idea. If I don't communicate that idea right away through an SMS or, or, or uh, whatever kind of message and leave it and wait for quality conversation later on, I will forget. I will no longer be able to communicate that message. So my life is. Is, 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 is a carrier scope of fragments mm -hmm. where I respond to cognitive challenges at the time when I am able to, and later I am not able to. But I don't feel it just depends on you. This is something that's being posed from the outside. I won't answer any more now, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have you finished? I have. Uh, can you just switch pages to the two minutes? I'll move to the common sense part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I will call it intervention also about the internet. But yeah, <laughs> I, I will improvise. So, so uh, I must admit that I share uh, Arendt's, both yours and Arendt's skepticism regarding speechless wonders and stuff like that, and also political importance of common sense. Uh, I, I believe that she's, she, she, she explicitly said that common sense is political sense par excellence. And it is, it, it is interesting, I had also selected that passage that Adriana said we live today in a world in which not even common sense makes any sense anymore. Uh, and at the end, I want to just repeated, he, she says that uh, we, we have the necessity for new political philosophy from which uh, we, could, we, we can uh, come to a new science of politics, etc. Et so I, I was just wondering uh, uh, how this reconstruction might look like. So we know that uh, Arendt tried to politicize or perhaps sociologize Kant's critique of judgment in order to achieve mm -hmm. this. And uh, she, she basically thought that judgment is inherently intersubjective or inherently public, and that, th th that this could provide a basis for public opinion that would naturally flow from the flux of everyday life, those 150 people that <laughs> interact. How, however, there are a couple of problems here, uh, namely uh, 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 what, what's, what's at stake is that uh, her reading of Kant had the specific aim of con uh, constructing a version of common sense that would be both plural and impartial, and that impartial part is where the, 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 where the problem starts. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, 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 many uh, scholars uh, 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 criticize this interpretation of Kant, but I, want, I don't want, I'm not an expert on Kant in, in, any, in, in any means, Igor is there, the, 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 the guy for that. But I, I want to try uh, something from, from a pragmatic point of view. Namely, when we speak about common sense, I'm always struck by the fact that we usually treat it as something which is homogeneous. Like, like it's 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 either a bad guy or a good guy or a, or a bad way of thinking, but but it's usually treated very very rigidly, 
And I think that common sense is basically heterogeneous. When, when we, and, and I would really like to see whether you think that there is you know, some, some sense in this kind of common sense. And it relies on, on, on uh, pragmatic uh, uh, ontology and pragmatic philosophy because much of the stuff that you said also, also really, really relates to, to, to pragmatism. So, for example, when you said about borderline situation in Jaspers, there is emergent situations in Mead, I believe, or, or problematic situations in Dewey, which are basically mm -hmm. the same, the same thing. And, and, and uh, from there we have also, but what is different here is that uh, 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 Dewey and, uh, ontology or Dewey and way of, of seeing uh, 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 the world is what he calls event ontology, which is something which is inherently holistic, where we don't have any strict divides. Basically, we don't need to, uh, to, to think as hard about what is inherently public and what is inherently private. And he's sort of trying to provide a way to think about states, uh, about processes and not about states, so that you have you know, this kind of radical holism, which is kind of, I think, would be beneficial to, to, to this kind of reconstruction that Arendt is trying to, to, to achieve. And also, when, when we <coughs> speak about common sense and the fact that it is not homogeneous, maybe we should also try to apply some kind of structure of common sense. Basically, that we might have something which is metaphysical, which is speechless wonder, or, I mean, sort of a speechless mm -hmm. wonder, which is non-verifiable, which is also problematic regarding our everyday action. Reduction is something that mm -hmm. resembles metaphysics in a ba bad way, which could be I think, uh, uh, criticized and deconstructed. And there is also a practical way of doing common sense. This is the good way of mm -hmm. achieving among small groups agreement and having this kind of, there is also, I wanted to just put, put in, in discussion this, this good idea of uh, Pierce, who's, who says that we need living doubt. And that means applying something that he calls critical common senseism which entails a critical acceptance of uncriticizable propositions. So at that, that is the starting point where we perhaps in this particularistic common sense, with all, which also relates through our idea of environment, of holism, towards something which is more universal. universal. So I was just thinking whether or not you find that this is sort of, you know, could, could pragmatism be an ally for us? Yeah, so that will be in another, <laughs> the basic gist of this question. And about the internet. So I was also skeptical about the internet, and I'm not on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, thanks for it. But, <laughs> but uh, there, I, I, I read, I, I love reading about history of, of everyday life. And when you read the history of everyday life, you see that basically the same arguments we put forward when, when publishing was becoming cheap. You know, it fragmented attention. It's you know, it's it, it's not good for you if you you are reading a lot of stuff all of a sudden. But then, if you like look at 18th century and the prices of, of publishing goes down, but and you have revolution at, 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 at the end of that century. So something political came with, you know, the way in which we communicate, and that has really really importance. And I was then I was like. Okay, so maybe I'm not, you know, like I, I, my skepticism regarding the, 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 the attention deficit was like shaken. And I was trying to see, so what is the big difference now? And the big difference now is the fact that uh, the, when, when press become cheap, uh, basically it democratizes reading. But now we have democratization of authorship. <laughs> So we are all writing something, we are all, you know, having a little opinion, blogs, and, and we are, in a sense, uh, we have this politically pertinent and politically important idea that we are not only, we are, we are not only the readers, we are also the authors. In some small way, mm -hmm. although, but for the first time on the massive scale. And this massive scale is something which is sort of important. I, I also share the, 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 the skepticism and the attention deficit is also pro problematic, especially for engagement. But yeah, so that, that's basically I hope mm -hmm. that it yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy that you're stressing the pragmatic standpoint. Um, I share very much and I think it's more and more important. And also you're stressing the question uh, of quality, of criteria 
of quality in the pragmatic standpoint. And I would say this quality only can come if people in sharing standpoints are open for criticism, open to share and to criticize each other. And, and this is somehow not easy. And you experience every day that there are people who will not be open to be criticized at any point. And, you, and to have their, their very flat opinions and, and they go in the public and everything's easy for them and clear and you know it's not correct. And you try to talk with them, it's not possible. They have a certain ideology and this ideology is connected to their personality, to the group they're living in. And you're asking, why are you not open for critical discussion? Critical talks could be so, so great in expanding your own viewpoint, showing you different possibilities, and you even get stronger afterwards. You have it with young students or older students whom you criticize when they hand in a paper. Yeah? Some are open for criticism, happy, open to learn, and others just see as an aggressive standpoint, yeah? Saying, I'm good enough already, yeah? What do you want? And for me, um, this, this attitude of, of knowing that I need criticism from other people. I have a certain quality, I know some things, but it's very good to know that I'm very limited and that criticism can help me from others if they give this criticism in a way that I can take it, yeah? not from above. So this culture of criticism is something very positive, is needed nowadays. Um, not criticism and showing off, oh, you're wrong at that, that point, and I'm the best guy around. But this openness because everybody has a certain possibility and this possibility means he's limited in other possibilities and he or she should be open to get to know more from other ones and to be corrected. And there, thereby we can somehow raise the quality of our arguments and standpoints. And it's not the question of the good and bad standpoint, if we were saying, but of getting better somehow. And if you see in philosophy of always schools and parties, and they're always fighting our standpoint is the only one. And the pragmatic standpoint is always seen as something in between, something unclear, people who don't want to take a stand. But I think the pragmatic point of becoming a little bit better sometimes in changing your opinion might be on the long run the most important one. Schools sometimes have the ability of showing at, at certain points which are neglected in the moment, yeah? But the pragmatic standpoint is the ability uh, to connect thoughts with reality in a certain way of judgment. Um, and therefore this critical exchange is the most important tool to reach this thing. And the second question, um, I'm skeptical too, um, but I think, as I said before, um, the, the invention of the internet is something very worthwhile. When I compare my scientific work uh, I can do now with, with the possibility of sending a, a, a paper to a friend somewhere in the world in five minutes or in a second, I'm getting an answer soon, yeah? perfect. Yeah? Um, so there's a great, um, great enrichment of our possibilities of working and exchanging thoughts with other people all over the world. And this is wonderful. And the only point is, are we strong enough to select, to choose? And are the people or the young people who, who, who encounter these possibilities um, gaining a point where they are open to select and choose and are able to, to live without knowing everything, to limiting them, themselves to the things they need to know. And this is somehow a seduction 
of knowing everything, an erotic seduction, huh? and it's very strong. And everybody wants to know everything around. And not knowing something means you're not informed. And the point is, nobody can be informed about everything. Yeah? But uh, living with this, yeah? and staying away from the seduction of knowing everything, huh? and being everywhere, this is very hard. And I don't know whether we can succeed in it, yeah? whether the seduction is too strong for us. But I would say, if you concentrate on the things you're doing and you're um, passionate about it, yeah? It might be that you concentrate enough positively, yeah? And it's not a negative concentration, yeah? They have to be positive energies about what you really want to do. And then you can select and choose. Can you Hopefully. <laughs> There is another uh, special thing in the seminar that we have split uh, Igor in two parts. Uh, two in one, one that's good. <laughs> because of plurality, yes. just being two in one and everything. So <laughs> Igor will now uh, begin with two questions and then we'll have Jacob leading on. Okay, I'll try to be as short as I can. Um, first, Question. I think that, that there is a problem that could be a little blurred or skipped in this text that is mentioned, but, but then I think blurred. When Arendt explains Socrates' meiotic method, uh, she stresses how Socrates trying to reveal the truth to one of his speaking, which is, appears as plural and so on. So, however, when she explains philosophical wonder, uh, she very easily slips to a problem of eternal truth. Uh, and in the, in the conclusion, it looked at this threat as mismatch of philosophers looking for these internal questions and being buggy uh, with a common sense because this is specific of wonder to eternal questions. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to see that it, the practical is made, same mismatch already existed uh, in Socrates' meiotic method. And even if we accept the truth, is just what appears and this, it appears as plural. And this conflict between Socrates and everyday self-understanding could be designated in the fact that in order this truth to actually become visible, to in some way to appear in discussion to those who is the, let's say, object of meritic method, uh, Socrates have needed to apply his skills and to give a birth to this truth, and that in this process usual self-understanding could reveal a solution, which Arendt also said. So if this means that if I'm a blacksmith, I have some truth that appeared to me, but probably I don't understand it. And uh, I have instead some soapy bubble opinions or truth and something. But the real blacksmith would say when Socrates came, probably he's gonna mad. And I think that it is a uh, thing of, of very different perspective between philosophers and I would like to argue any critical scientist, social scientist. Uh, who will in any moment say, okay, keep digging, find it, and perspective, take it as it seems to be, or uh, take it as you wish. Uh, and what I think is that, that this prob the problem between philosophy and common sense opinion, let's say, uh, was always primarily this conflict when philosophy came to be engaged in banal things. Okay, there is a problem with eternal question, but I didn't show that, that anyone have problem with philosophy because of questioning big questions except pr probably Christianity. Mostly the problem came into the story when philosophers start to question most banal questions. And that's what Socrates obviously doing. So I, I could say that probably aren't in some way showed, but with some ambivalence that the problem is solved when she changes metaphysical presuppositions, the truth is not essence but as appearance, and the truth is plural but not singular. But as I said, can see that actually doesn't address this problem, and problem is not solved because it, it, even there, that could still be, and that is a, probably a ambivalent scenario, that uh, appearance could be 
false appearance, it could appear wrong, our self-understanding could be wrong, and we still have this problem that even if true it's appearance and plural, it could go wrong. So I think it's important to think about this problem because I think that is nowadays also actually the problem that philosophers and any critical science uh, uh, is exposed to because uh, when you try to do even not having idea that you have some uh, some some primary uh, assess to the truth, but just to what point going to show that uh, people should look should more to what appears to them as a true, you're coming like, let's say, unwanted psychiatrist who want to say that you have a problem, but, but, but you don't want someone to tell you it's a problem. And the second question, very short, that I think that you should keep in mind that there is three different conflicts here, at least one conflict between politics and philosophy. Uh, politics are very broadly understand the second probably unavoidable between philosophical wonder and common sense but I think and probably for me most important that aren't mentioned in some places that is conflict inside common sense inside common sense yeah the problem that common sense is itself discommunicative that there is no communicability between the people in common sense you have some questions related to that but what I just want to say, if we could take more materialistic position, we could probably explain uh, all uh, conflicts between politics and philosophy and po philosophy and common sense from what's going on, let's say, in, in basic happening in common sense. Also, for, for example, we could uh, explain body soul, Timo's division, or they're looking what happened actually in society and how is society is divided and so on and the probably way to looking how the, this conflict could be solved is looking what actually ha happened in a basic commonwealth and how uh, came to this uh, this communication and partiality in the common sense why we're living together but still not living together and that that why the conflict or in politics and in philosophy came in because all the all of them tried just to push the part of communicable uh, questions which are not actually communicable for the others. So thank you Igor, for your questions. Um, I want to start with the end. I'm not sure whether we should solve the conflict. Yeah, like the whole history is full of the conflict of people misunderstanding each other. I think this is some of our historical fate. Uh, otherwise, historians wouldn't have to do anything. Eh? They, they, they write histories of people misunderstanding each other out of different um, origins. And I would read Hannah Arendt as someone having an idea there are certain moments of possible understanding in a world of misunderstanding. And we will never be able to solve the problem of understanding in the world, but we might experience some moments where certain people have the chance to understand each other and have at least the chance to understand for the others too. And for me, it was so striking rereading the text when she wrote about the immortality of philosophers, of thinkers. And I think there's somehow the idea, um, I know your name uh, um, was mentioned for the genius, yeah? And I think somehow art has the idea of some people who are in a certain way geniuses, who are immortal because they say in a certain way, in a certain time, things which are decisive for the time and for later times. And I think, therefore, this thinking is, or this essay isn't a light essay. Uh, for, for a certain group of people who have a great erudition, who went to universities, who have a culture of exchanging thoughts, who are somehow the ones who have the obligation to overview life or to, to show some perspectives in life for themselves, for their friends and for others in the way they're writing. They're somehow like the social obligation of the intellectual, yeah? And somehow the, the idea of becoming immortal I think Hannah Arendt didn't believe in a uh, life afterwards. 
but she somehow was struck by the, by the idea, how can I become immortal? And she did a good job. Nowadays, she's one of the few philosophers who was immortal in our times. Everybody, like trains are called after Hannah Arendt, yeah? It's, yes, Hannah Arendt, <laughs> train in Germany. So every politician knows her, yeah? Like she became some of an icon of thinking, and many people misunderstand her. But the point is, um, in a world of misunderstanding, there are some people who have the ability, the genius, to think things together in a certain way, and at least show uh, for others possibilities as philosophers how they could gain at least a little bit of understanding each other. And if you look at her biography, huh, that's a mess of misunderstanding yeah, with many people. So even she was not a genius in the way that she understood perfectly with many friends or people who were friends and so on, but she misunderstood others and she was misunderstood. So somehow um, her history, her biography shows very well that understanding is only like a regulative idea huh? and accessible for some people in certain circumstances with a high culture uh, of learning how to understand. And in that sense, she's a light thinker, yeah? But still, and this is important too, uh, being open that even everyday people should start to think, yeah? So she has a certain arrogance, and many of her American friends, like Alfred Kazin or others, were saying, okay, she's the well erudited German intellectual with Greek and Latin in the background. And when you have this interview with Günther Gauss, yeah? She's talking, yes, I read Greek with 15, 16, so she really knew how to show off a little bit too, yeah? So it's somehow a certain social arrogance in her, yeah? Or if she talks about the East and West Jews, yeah? The Jews with culture and the Jews without culture, you see there's a certain arrogance in her and a certain knowledge of how cultivated she is. This is one side of her. And the other one is that she's a very open person for everybody, yeah? So she's not co she's not co coherent totally, yeah. Um, but this is one answer, and the other one, um, yes, you were mentioning all those conflicts: yeah, politics, philosophy, common sense, um, and it's like uh, my answer to to Olga. I think all the essay can do is uh, demonstrate this problem and. To her way of trying to harmonize it, to harmonize it somehow, but it's not convincing. So there are still problems, and um, and uh, this is for for me somehow excellent because, um, and I think therefore Hannah Arendt will be read for a long time because she she's not um, someone who's who's giving us a worldview uh, who's harmonized or an idea of the total thing and how to gain at a certain point to to certain perfect condition of life. And this is for me um, somehow an expression of self-critical understanding. Yeah? So there's not more I could say. Yeah, it's okay. Me <laughs> Endless talk. I think no, I don't. I'm, do you I'm need fine. No. Okay. I need um. a schnapps. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is it's the the hunger clinic. I have a Versuch, yeah, etwas in the room. I need to be talking and take that to bring him. Eigentlich noch einen Spieler oder noch zwei Spieler so in dieses Spiel, Spiel ja, oder Gesprächspartner, also so Dialogpartner äh, in dieses äh, Spiel zu bringen. Da sind dann vor allem also Axel Honneth, aber dann auch irgendwie auch äh, Hans-Georg Adamer. Da, darauf komme ich dann später. 
Dakle, ovo je sad pokušaj da jednu malo pre, kako se kaže, prenatignutu tezu stavimo ovaj. Unesemo ovu diskusiju, uvešću nekoliko novih igrača, odnosno ne igrača, nego partnera u razgovoru, odnosno partnera u ovoj igri. To su prije svega Axel Honet i kasnije Hans Georg Adamer. Weil sie auch stark auf Modell des Dialogs aufbauen, weil die halt etwas ambivalentes Verhältnis zu Anerkennung haben, beziehungsweise bei Axel Honneth ist er von der zentralen Bedeutung, bei Hans-Georg Adamer ist er sozusagen das verschwiegene Moment des Dialogs, das wirft ihm Axel Honneth vor in einigen Texten. Dakle, zašto radim to? Dakle, ovdje su, zašto ovi ljudi? Zato što on postoji jedan određen ambivalentan odnos prema momentu priznanja, a on je ovdje centralan sad u ovoj priči. Naprimjer, kod Aksela Honeta je on centralni pojam i konstitutivni pojam, bitan pojam za dialog. Kod Hans Georg Adamera je on onaj nespomenuti onaj moment, bitni moment koji je Hans Georg Adamer prešutao prema Honetovoj kritici, dakle Honetova kritika prema Gadamer. I tu će se kasnije vratiti na Hanu Arendt, naravno, da komiš Petar Aukov Hanu Arendtu, verdikci Einbinden. To što je gut. Natürlich, ja, ja, kaj je problem, da se dakle skoveri. Vazak Honet, also, ich citire in ovu kurc eine Stelle aus Kampf um Anerkennung, er sagt, die Reproduktion des gesellschaftlichen Lebens vollzieht sich unter dem Imperativ einer reziproken Anerkennung, weil die Subjekte zu einem praktischen Selbstverständnis nur gelangen können, wenn sie sich aus der normativen Perspektive, Perspektive ihrer Interaktionspartner als deren soziale, soziale Adressaten zu begreifen werden. Das heißt, ohne zufolge kann das Ausbleiben der Anerkennung zur Gefährdung des der Selbstverhältnisse der Subjekte führen. Es kommt dann zu Hegemonisierung des Diskurses und der andererseits zu Disqualifizierung bestimmter Diskurse oder bestimmter Momente in bestimmten Diskursen. Ja. Dakle, zašto Honet? Šta kaže Honet u stvari? Koja je njegova pozicija? I otkud ovde dialog? Šta je po njega dialog? Dakle, Kaže na mjestu borba za priznanje, u svojoj knjizi borba za priznanje, kaže reprodukcija društvenog života se sprovodi pod imperativom recipročnog priznanja, jer subjekti mogu da dođu do praktičnog samoodnosa samo onda kada nauče da se shvataju polazeći, ili da se razumijevaju polazeći od normativne perspektive svojih interakcijonih partnera kao svojih socijalnih adresata. Dakle, izostanak priznanja znači ugrožavanje samo odnosa subjekta. Odnosno, izostanak priznanja u određenom dialogu, u određenoj interakciji dovodi ka, s jedne strane, hegemonizaciji u okviru diskursa, s druge strane ka određenim strategijama ili praksama diskvalifikacije u okviru diskursa. Da zim centrale tezim zajedno, ok, da pojim. Da se vrden auh Hans-Georg Adamer und auch Hannah Arendt unterschreiben und wahrscheinlich auch Sokrates, oder er würde das sagen, er würde das nicht unterschreiben, wenn er nicht schreibt. Dakle, ovo bi priznali vjerovatno ovu poziciju i Hannah Arendt, i Hans-Georg Adamer, i Sokrat. On ne bi možda potpisao ovu poziciju, bi rekao da je to, dobro, tako. Jetzt komme ich zur Sache. Genau. Nochmal... Nochmal uh, Axel Honneth. Also da das, das ist das, uh, dieses Modell uh, von, also dieses Schema von drei Modellen, der drei Modelle des Dialogs. Also es gibt, er unterscheidet drei Modelle. A, B und C jetzt in dieser meiner Ausführung. Das A, autoritäres Modell. Das heißt, zum Beispiel nach dem Paradigma Lehrer Schüler, das ist ein klassisches Lehrer-Schüler-Modell. Schüler wird nicht anerkannt. Die Vermittlung läuft in eine Richtung. 
Das heißt, es gibt eine Autorität, die Wahrheit besitzt, die vermittelt sie nur. B. Scheinbar freies Dialog. Die Anerkennung ist nur formal. Die inhaltliche Vermittlung verläuft wie beim autoritären Modell, also nur in eine Richtung. Ungefähr können wir das so an einem Psychoanalytiker-Modell, ich will ja nicht beinahe treten. Na, aber, gut, ja. Ja, da wird Gespräch gemacht, aber im Grunde, der Gesprächs-, es gibt einen Gesprächsführer, der einen Rahmen setzt, also des Gesprächs. Das Gespräch kontrolliert und sich immer aus dem Gespräch ziehen Habermas kann. hat darüber geschrieben. Ja. ja. Wer, wer hat geschrieben? Habermas. Ja, Habermas. Der kennt das, das Interesse. Ja, aber das hat er als Modell des ja, freien Gesprächs. Okay, da kommen wir noch dazu. Ähm, und C, ein nicht autoritäres Modell, äh, gekennzeichnet durch gegenseitige Anerkennung der Dialogpartner. Die Ver Vermittlung läuft in beide Richtungen. Dakle, dakle na Osnovu ovoga Honetovog pojma auf priznanja, možemo da razvijemo model, äh, u stvari on ga razvija, tri vrste äh, dialoga, to je autoritarni dialog u kome posredovanje ide samo jednom pravcu, to je paradigmatski tajne, kao klasični model odnos učitelja i, 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 i učenika, u kojem učitelj posjede određenu istinu, istinu ili kompet, 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 kompetitivnost, <laughs> kompet, kompetenciju i posreduje samo jednom pravcu. Onda imamo prividni, kod B prividni dialog, gdje je priznanje samo formalno, ali u stvari sadrž, a, 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 posredovanje ide također u jednom pravcu. Naprimjer, moglo bi se to uzeti kao odnos psihoanalitičara i njegovog pacijenta, gdje se to vodi kao određen dialog, a u stvari psihoanalitičar određaju granice i okvire a, terapije, odnosno razgovora, ali je to u stvari terapija koja se zove i C, neautoritarni ne model, a, to je model u kome su razne ide u oba pravca, Dakle, jedan i drugi su tako reći u igri i njihovi stavovi su tako reći uh, uh, u igri i mogu da se mijenja i mogu među sobom da utiču. Ok. Gadamer, Arendt und Honet beansprochen die Position C und mit Arendt auch Sokrates. Dakle, rekli bi da Gadamer i Honet i Han Arendt zajedno sa Sokratom bi se složili da je njihova pozicija, ova pozicija C, jel? dakle neautoritarnog modela dialoga. Vaza gadame. Ich erkenne den Wahrheitsanspruch des nicht transparenten, dunklen bzw. nicht verständlichen Du, wenn wir von ich du verhältnis sprechen, bzw. einer Fremdheit an. Die Wer erkennt das nicht? Nach Gadamerscher Ausführung, die radikale Aufklärung erkennt das nicht, der Scientismus und in gewisser Weise ist das alles eine schlechte Metaphysik, dahinter oder eine Anwesenheitsmetaphysik in Heiliger Schön. Ja. Das ist die Position A. Šta kaže Gadamer? Gadamer kaže, Pozicija C je ta, njegova, njegova, u njegovoj izvedbi, Uh, priznajem uh, pretenziju ka istini ovoga netransparentnog ili kako kaže tamnog ili mračnog, neprozirnog, uh, odnosno nerazumljivog ti, kada govorimo o odnosu ja ti, odnosno njegovu stranost, tuđost, tuđost. Ko je pozit na poziciji A ili eventualno poziciji B, to su radikalno prosvjetiteljstvo, znači ima njegova uh, uh, da kaže predrasuda protiv predrasuda, dakle, radikalnog prosvjetiteljstva. A je nastavnik Đak, to? Da, 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 radikalno prosvjetiteljstvo, ili ovdje u Sokratovi za tuj Platon, ne? Scientismus, modernoj verziji, ne? I, naravno, sve su to loše metafizike na kraju krajeva, ili metafizike prisutnosti u Heideggerovi, što je ono rečeno. Šta kaže, vazak Hanna Arendt? Uh, als Anwältin von Sokrates. Uh, Sokrates erkenne den Wahrheitsanspruch, den Wahrheitsanspruch der fremden Doxa an uh, und Platon ist der Model A zu zuordnen. Das heißt, in der Meutik oder Meutik, wie sagt man, ich weiß jetzt nicht, uh, ich kenne beides, uh, kommt dieses Wahrheitsanspruch der Doxa uh, sozusagen ans Licht. Ja. 
Und das ist dann, das geschieht in, in freiem Dialog. Dakle, šta kaže Hannah Arendt? Dakle, Sokrat priznaje pretenziju ka istini strane dokse, stranog mišljenja. Jesu mi previše vremena? To je taj model C. Dok je Platon u ovoj verziji, kako ovaj tumače to Hannah Arendt, pripada ovaj model A. I Platon bi se vjerojatno i složio. Okay, dann wieder zum Axel Honneth. Und dann werden wir das auf Kadamer und Hanaren beziehen. Noch was dann? Soll ich zu aufhören? Na, wenn noch mal, ich glaube, dann ist gut. Dann ist es gut. Ja, ja, okay, okay, machen wir das Schluss. Jetzt, Honneth, also, das ist die These jetzt, meine ich. Also, was äh, eigentlich fehlt bei Arendt und hm. Sokrates? Was würde Honneth sagen? Gadamer und Hannah Arendt bzw. Sokrates operieren mit einem eher substanziellen Wahrheitsbegriff. Daher sind sie dem Modell B zuzuordnen. Habe ich schon aufgeschrieben? Scheinbar, okay. okay. Das sage ich, habe ich heute auch gesagt im Gespräch. Also, was passiert bei Gadamer und, und Arendt bzw. Sokrates? Hier ereignet sich die Wahrheit bzw. Logos im Dialog. Der Dialog bzw. Dialogsubjekte sind keine richtigen Subjekte. Sie erfahren nur eine formale Anerkennung, damit sie die Wahrheit in ihrer substanziellen Kraft ausspielen können, ans Licht bringen können, sozusagen. Die Wahrheit entwirkt sich. Ich mache das zu Ende, dann übersetze ich das. Das Modell C kann erreicht werden, nach Honnets Modell, nur wenn Gemeinschaft als Wahrheit anerkannt wird. Nicht die Wahrheit. Also. Das ist jetzt meine Formulierung. Ich erkläre das, was, ich werde das verdeutlichen. Die Gemeinschaft eigentlich in dieser, was ist, heißt die Wahrheit der Gemeinschaft? Die Gemeinschaft ist der, was wir sagen, Honet, der anerkannte Dritte. Der Ort der eigentlichen Anerkennung. Oder in transzendental philosophischen äh, Terminologie, die Bedingung der Möglichkeit für die Anerkennung der Subjektivität steht, herstellt. Das heißt, die Gemeinschaft muss anerkannt werden erstmal als eine Art regulative Idee, damit die Subjekte erstmal sich gegenseitig anerkennen können. So. Demnach scheitert Sokrates in der Gemeinschaft, wie Anna Arendt das ausführt, beziehungsweise er kann sich den Polis nicht verständlich machen, weil er die Gemeinschaft doch nicht als Wahrheit anerkennt, die, die Wahrheit der Gemeinschaft nicht anerkennt. Er erkennt nur die Wahrheit bzw. Logos an. Die Wahrheit der Menschen bzw. Logos der Gemeinschaft nicht an. So. Zum Glück. Okay. Gut. Ich übersetze ich nur und dann verzeihen, dass ich das ist sehr gut. Okay. Da kriegst du das zusammen, wo du hast, da da mehr Sokrates. Da kriegst du die These da mal, ja. Und das ist das, wie ich hast, 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 koristi u ovom kontekstu. Dakle, prema Honetu bi Gadamer i Hana Arenta, odnosno Sokrat, operišu sa jednim substancijalnim pojmom istine. U širim smislu substancijalnim. S toga su one, oni pripadaju modelu B, u najboljim slučaju. Dakle, nam je prividno posredovanje ovog pravca. Zašto? Zato što se ovdje istina događa. Dakle, logo se događa. Izlazi na svjetlo u razgovoru, u dijalogu. To ona kaže, dakle, partnerima, onda se to, maja utika, ili kako se to kaže ovdje, maja utika, dakle, iznosi na svjetlo. Isto kod Gadamera, dešava se, porađa, da, upravo. Dakle, u tom slučaju, dijalog i subjekti dijaloga nisu pravi subjekti. Oni su samo formalno priznati subjekti. Dakle, da bi se u bili momenti u tom poražanju substancijalne istine. Model C se može dostići samo onda ako se, e sad ja sam to nazvao malo, ako se zajednica prizna kao istina. Dobro, ali polako, polako, polako. To znači, das heist, Zajednica je onaj u konetovoj terminologiji priznati treći. Dakle, mjesto 
istinskog priznanja. Odnosno, u onome jeziku koje razumijem, u transcendentalnoj filozofskoj terminologiji, uslov mogućnosti priznanja subjektivnosti. Dakle, zajednica mora da se prizna kao mjesto istine, da bi se subjekti mogli međusobno je priznati. Zajednica u transcendentalnom filozofskom smislu kao regulativna ideja. Ne možemo je koja je sad zajednica, ne taj zajednica, istin to ova nije, nego imamo regulativnu ideju istine te zajednice, moramo da odnosi ili slobodne zajednice, ili neautoritarne zajednice. Da bi uopšte ušli, mogli da se priznamo kao i otpočnemo dijelu. E samo, no kurc, da lese punkt univerzacije, zašto Sokrat ne uspijeva u polisu? Zato što on u stvari ne priznaje polis. On priznaje istinu. Ne priznaje istinu polisa kao okvira. Nego on priznaje tu kao nekakav potencijal u kome se može naći istina. A ne polis kao regulativnu ideju, kao nešto što ima neku istinu, nego on traže substancijalnu istinu koja je za sve. Ok. Izvinjam se ako sam zašao. Hvala vam što ste učiniti to three approaches to the dialogue. Um, as far as I can answer, I would say you're partly right and you're partly wrong from my perspective. And um, I'm totally convinced that Ponit is right that the approach of Arendt and Gadamer have a certain substance yeah? and a certain idea. Um, but they're different, totally different. The idea of the dialogue of Gadamer is an idea where the subject has a minor function because he has the idea of an over-history, über-geschichte. And the subject is the one who has somehow to understand what the over-history is in the dialogue. So the substance of Gadamer is a certain idea of über-geschichte. And the subject is only important in getting to know what the truth of Übergeschichte is, of overhistory is. And I don't like this approach at all. Because it seems to be very open, but then he has a certain very clear idea connected to the tradition, to the Platonic tradition, what truth could be still. And it's a certain way of mingling Uh, historicism and idealism and Heideggerism and and I'm totally convinced you're right that it's a, a apparently free dialogue but going to a certain point and and this main work Wahrheit und Methode in the beginning is very clear that the subject is only a little flame So, for me, Gadamer is overrated totally. Uh, as a thinker who has a seemingly free approach in the hermeneutics, but giving an idea of overhistory, which is very conservative and which is not open for the modern experience. So, it's another question, and then would be an own seminar, yeah? the actuality of, Heide of, of Gadamer. But I think he's a traditional thinker with a great rhetoric ability. I heard him once or twice and I was struck by his way, was ist Wahrheit? And we all were somehow in the, fascinated by his way of talking. But this was it. And whenever you read his texts, like I did for, for my work, I read some texts very closely, I was disappointed. But this is another thing to talk about Gadamer. But I would think he's overrated. I don't think so. Yeah, but <laughs> this is like, like my personal opinion. But we had to discuss it more closely. Okay. Um, and for Arendt, as you could think, I'm not thinking she's overrated. Because surely she has a certain idea of what truth could be. Yeah? And you told totally right that Socrates himself, in the way he's asking his friends what is the good, what is justice, yeah? is having a certain idea about these things. Oh, it's not a free dialogue, it's a dialogue where he or she has a certain idea about things. But it's more free than the dialogue of Ghana because he wants to provoke the people to talk. And, and he loves the 
the subjectivity of the people. And he's not interested in the overhistory. He's interested in getting people to know about themselves with a certain idea, sure. But there's a great difference between uh, the dialogue Hannah Arendt, Socrates, and the dialogue Garam was leading. And both have a certain substance. And now to hone it, I don't know hone it very well. But I am not convinced by the idea of the community as truth. Yeah? Um, what, what is it? Um, I think community is a condition of our life. Like we are here now together, but this is not the truth, this is a fact. We, have, we can talk together, but this... Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, das ist meine vielleicht überzogene Formulierung. Okay. Ich habe das auf transzendental philosophisches Punkt bezogen, okay. also so, regulative Idee. And, and okay. I have to admit, I never read one, so I, I'm not able to, to say more about him. But what I was experiencing, I heard him once in Tübingen. And he was somewhat taking the psychological approach on things. Good, good, good. So it's your part now. Good. Like, my argument is that uh, the subjective recognition is always, in a way, historically mediated in the sense that yes. we learn historically to perceive normative important features of others in the subjective interactions. And that is the horizon of the community, okay. which can be transcended. Thank you. Now, this is correct. Can or can? Sorry. Can. Can. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, that's right. Not in that direct subjective yeah. Now, the social change theory okay. is a little bit this I can understand, and this would be for me acceptable. Das ist auch die regulative Idee, aber etwa in einem Geschichtsmodell umgewandelt. Okay. Wie transzendentaler Pragmatismus. Then I'm fine with that. Okay. So, when it yes, got him a no. Okay. Matthias, we have two more interventions. Would you prefer us to have a 10 minute break? Yes, I think I get your question and we should have a break. I think it's good. Okay. <laughs> this time I'll be much shorter. Uh, Diana, I suppose, favorite question is about private public. Mm -hmm. So, Aaron begin with the thesis that with Socrates and Plato, the goal between philosophy and polity emerged. However, what we have before it, Thales who fell into wheel, Heraclitus who wandered in the desert, Pythagorean sects, crazy guys from Alea who claim that there is no movement. Uh, so, practically no contact with politics and not with the public. Uh, and we also have a culture, which you know, anti culture, um, where philosophizing is usual. We see it in the literature, usual. And, but almost all, in any time, as a private activity. You see, epic and tragic hero, philosophizing, asking eternal questions or banal questions as they appear to them, but on their own. So, what I think the whole pre Socratic philosophy is meant to be done in private. And Socrates' engaged activity, this could be understood as a kind of perversion of private and public in a sense that he put it on Agora something that should be far away from it in a private sphere. So he made philosophy as public engaged, asking, uh, asking people questions that probably they ask themselves also, but in a private sphere and not in a public. And I, I think that the then here philosophy could be seen as a part of dynamic of inclusion and exclusion in and from a public sphere. And it is systematic and in some way tragic that Plato ended in laws, not in Republic, not with the philosopher's rulers, but with, a, if it's good translation, secret nightclubs, which will discuss any possible social changes. Secret nightclubs? Yeah, um, um well, secret clubs. House. Secret House. night council. Tell people who okay. unite and in private discuss yeah. possible social changes and no one knows circles. what they are doing and what they're talking it's about. Laws, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Esoteric circles. Mm? Esoteric yeah, circles. Yeah, but like this. This. Okay. any social change will be discussed in such places in mm -hmm. late Plato. Uh, so, why, why this? 
question is important. Mm -hmm. I think it's nowadays also the same question. Are these philosophical questions right? part of private life, it should be discussed in public. We have yesterday with this Weber story also this question. We came mm -hmm. to this question, it, is not, it cannot be dedicated, and probably we should leave everyone in their small circles or in their private life asking themselves about this question, but it's not something for a public discussion. And my last question is just, if you know, or probably if Jacob knows, some infra bi biographical information. Heidegger in uh, 1931 have these uh, lectures uh, over the Svezen der Weifheit, or Sustine Istine, that are about Plato cave story and Tetet, with many similarities and non similarities with this current thesis. He speaks about through the Sopanas, uh, Salatea. Uh, he speak about he uh, pointed on the question why philosopher returned to the to the cave after he came to the light and so on. So did probably aren't attended this as far as I know. Uh, she was in that time in good relation with Heidegger, but already finished his study, her studies. So if if he attended it, read it, or mm -hmm. is this story probably have some connection or trying to reply to Heidegger? Yeah, thank you for your questions. Um, yeah, Igor, how to answer? Um, first, I would say philosophy is always something private. Huh? It starts with private communication in a trustful atmosphere. Yeah? So I think the most important is not the private, it's the trustful atmosphere, where people are open to open up themselves. And this must could be in a public seminar where a person is able to, to create an atmosphere of trust. And the existent of Hannah Arendt, uh, John Cohn, wrote an essay lately, I could send it to you, uh, about the atmosphere in Hannah Arendt seminars. Yeah? And the interesting thing was that he was showing that the seminars of art were somehow private, but somehow something where people could perform, show themselves like in theater, wearing certain masks again. And I think this form of playing yeah, with the others in a certain atmosphere of openness, yeah, this is somehow uh, connected very, very strongly to Hannah Arendt. So it needs a certain trustfulness to open up, but when you open up, you're playing theater. You're wearing a mask, you're showing yourself somehow. You're trying to play this or that role. And this is like a creative act, and it needs a certain atmosphere. And when you see Hannah Arendt acting in a seminar or in an official tour or giving a speech, we all have an idea how she was yeah? and how she was showing herself in the public. And I think um, she really was controlling herself, how she showed up in the public. And therefore I would say between the private and the public there is a big gray zoom yeah? uh, of connection. And even private talks are public talks, in a certain way. And public talks could be private talks, if you find the tools how to show up in the public. So for me, it would be the question, how we can develop tools of showing in the public without showing us totally. Like this is the art. Giving certain aspects which we think are very important but without being naked. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be naked in the public. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> normally not. Or you have a trustful atmosphere, yeah? or you want to show something. So there's a certain ability of being naked in the public but it needs an atmosphere for it. Yeah? Openness. Um, and nakedness could be tyranny, yeah? There were certain times when everybody thought he has 
you should be naked in the public or with friends, yeah? But Maybe nobody yeah. liked it, yeah? Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, it uh, probably knows uh, what uh, Mark Weber did in Ascona. Yes. So, no. we live in Svarna, yeah. and nudism and all things that actually, yeah. at the end of the 19th century, we have lived uh, in the mid 60s uh, with the uh, hippies. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but what did he do in Ascona? Okay. Okay. The first, the interesting thing was when he went to Ascona, yeah? Yes. He went in a public road. <laughs> So he was fearing this atmosphere, mm -hmm. and just in the end of his life, he was opened up. But this was a private, huh? And that was uh, an experiment. And so, very. Uh, what did he do? Uh, he, as a very complex uh, personality, uh, from time to time had the uh, um, well uh, knee or felt need to uh, recover. So he went uh, to Italian Alps uh, uh, to Ascona. Uh, uh, by the end of the 19th century, and uh, um, as a matter of fact, his lover was there with his with her husband, and uh, so uh, uh, Maria Nevada, who was uh, in touch with him by writing two letters, uh, so he is writing to her uh, about what is happening in. Uh, and uh, how is observing like, it only. Yes, observing only. <laughs> uh, going through uh, all this uh, uh, um, um, somehow relaxing and uh, um, easygoing uh, living experiments. So, yes. But the interesting thing is that even those easygoing experiments weren't easy at all. Absolutely. That's the point. So, the certain attempt of finding easiness, huh? Yeah? And this is what I meant with authenticity. Yeah? It's not possible to be authentic, to, to be naked all the time. So you somehow wear always a mask or keep yourself a role, even if this role is being naked. Yeah? It's still a role. So, and this is part of our culture. Yeah? And, but coming back to, to this question, I would think um, the task for us as people who do philosophy and think about these things is how could we um, bring things which we think are important in a certain way in a public where people can really think about it and find the right, word, uh, the right words for it, the means for writing, huh? finding a language which people understand beyond ac the academic language. Very important for, for becoming public. Huh? But when we look at Socrates' example, what he had done, he found a language that is understandable. Mm -hmm. That's why, as you know, the yacht liked him, and the people with whom he talked liked him. Yeah. But then came the general opinion, opinion, okay, what you are doing in a public sure. life is not for a public life. Though there's a certain offensiveness, huh? and you won't convince everybody. And, and therefore, I think it's important to, to find uh, an art of showing and demonstrating things um, which, which leaves a space between you and the public. Um, like, like an artist or if you give a public speech, it's always the question, how can I tell something and, um, and hide myself a little bit? because people might be aggressive or I don't want to come too close with them. And this is a question of, of art. Find the right language, right words. So thinking about these things uh, should be more important for philosophy. How can we go into the public without losing what we want to say? Not simplifying it, yeah? not making philosophy shows out of it. Yeah? Um, this could be enough. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and Sanya? Uh, Sanya, uh, actually, at the end of the uh, exchange, the exchange we had, I changed my mind. So I'm going to talk about, uh, about something else. And I'm going to, uh, you probably know, 
uh, about the exchange uh, letters between uh, Karl Jaspers and uh, Hannah Arendt. Uh, and uh, in 1955, uh, Arendt uh, went for the first time to the West Coast, uh, to Berkeley, to teach there. She has been offered a position to teach there, but then she refused. Among other things, uh, the reason was that uh, it's too loose, their way of thinking, living, etc., etc. So it's not her cup of tea, uh, referring to what you've said about her seminars. And uh, uh, the, the, why it's important, uh, this uh, uh, exchange and uh, uh, mentions of uh, desert and oasis in uh, these uh, letters, in this uh, um, explanation to Jaspers uh, uh, how it went in Berkeley. And she uh, mentioned uh, a figure of a docker. Uh, yes. Uh, who is uh, actually having great time because he is uh, working for two to three days and the rest of the time he's wandering, writing, reading and living, living easy. Uh, uh, the other uh, figure uh, that she mentioned uh, was uh, also a PhD student who is encaved uh, in her room with books, Plato, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so, uh, what those two figures are doing? Well, they are in an oasis, and the others are in the desert. Uh, and now we come um, to her writings which uh, uh, Ursula Lutz uh, collected and uh, published in uh, Basis Politique. And uh, uh, she commented a few fragments uh, found in uh, her Arendt's manuscripts. Uh, and among other uh, parts or other fragments was uh, the position, Socrates' position, then uh, um, philosophy and politics, uh, what does it mean to uh, um, uh, to, to be in, uh, uh, what, what is it, uh, uh, philosophy of politics? Uh, and uh, in these fragments, uh, it's just three to four pages, and I read it in, in French because it's very good translation. Uh, uh, so in these uh, uh, three pages, she's um, opposing uh, two, uh, two uh, figures, uh, which is uh, the desert and the oasis, uh, as a metaphors of what? Of uh, something which uh, uh, turns us back to Nietzsche, uh, and uh, uh, actually critique of, uh, Aaron's critique of Nietzsche, uh, if you remember in, in Zaratustra, uh, he's like lamenting, oh, uh, um, the desert is uh, invading us, uh, in a sense of doxa is invading us. Now, uh, we, are lo uh, we are just abandoned and uh, uh, ourselves, uh, we are now exposed to doxa, to uh, uh, ordinary, uh, ordinary life. So uh, Aaron goes back against, uh, against this and explains uh, uh, what is it that we are living through this uh, 20th century. That's, that's her century. So, uh, and she says, okay, so it's a psychology who made us live uh, interior, interiorize ourselves, and uh, uh, in psychology, uh, actually, we have, uh, again, three positions. We have, uh, uh, so that's the uh, uh, artist who is isolated. Then uh, it's uh, a philosopher who is also uh, lonely, solitude. And, and then love. What, what is it that makes us uh, uh, out of the world? Well, special relations uh, uh, with our effective uh, investment, huge effective investment. And all this actually are figures that are uh, restraining us from the uh, public, from uh, our interference into public. And uh, uh, it was extraordinary to follow this uh, uh, 
figure of the desert and the uh, oasis uh, through uh, uh, Socrates' life uh, uh, and the understanding, Arendt's understanding of uh, how Socrates actually lived and has been exposed uh, to the polis, but also uh, to this specific uh, meiotics uh, technique, which is a private technique. I mean, who is going to get, give birth in public? Who is giving birth in public? Who, who is that, uh, as you said, for, for uh, uh, nakedness, uh, who is going to uh, be a, as open as to uh, give birth, even to the truth? So that's, that's certainly not the uh, place where we can reach uh, uh, the truth. Yeah. Um. I think that the point is um, we all want to know about ourselves mm -hmm. and we all have ideas and we all try to share these ideas with other ones yeah? and hope that we in sharing and reflecting those ideas somehow come to our truth mm -hmm. but not knowing what our truth is. I think this is so on the one side inspiring of wanting to but recognizing we won't ever succeed, we won't come to the truth. Mm -hmm. But what we can do on the way in philosophy or literature is express our attempts, what we think in this or that moment about these things. And, and this expression itself is, is something which needs the recognition of other people, like the reading of other ones of ourselves. And, and in this way of expressing ourselves, we are always somehow shameful. We're not giving everything, and we don't know everything. So it's both. It's, it's not knowing and not giving. Mm -hmm. But this keeps life going on. I think it's such a good thing if you find a writer or philosopher of whom you can say uh, he's at his point, trying to understand his history in his country, in his family, what he's going through in the works he's writing, or the essays, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if this person is a good writer, um, there's always this certain ambivalence, this openness, this not being too self-assured, this always not knowing too well what he's talking about. And, um, and the certain quality of someone who's expressing himself, like I come back with Samilo Kish, we, we saw yesterday his widow, um, the certain way, and Kish was saying, I'm always only interested in books where I can feel the writer in. The biography of the person, what he thinks or what she thinks. And, and he was always skeptical on people who were somehow connecting her attempt of finding the truth with a too clear idea what the truth is. And when we, we read books of the 60s, 70s, 80s, which were written by people who knew very exactly in that time what the truth was. We are somehow bored. There might be still some interesting passages and a great style, but people who know, who knew too well what was the truth, they vanish with the time. They have a certain time, it's interesting and maybe very popular at the time. But I think those writers who stay are those who are still, you know myself, and people are open mm -hmm. and don't know very clearly what they want. And open up a space between them and the public or the private readers um, where both sides can, can look at the written words and can try to understand it again. And I think therefore this problem of not knowing ourselves or not being able to express ourselves very exactly uh, gives birth to the culture of philosophy and literature. And, and something very precious, the ability of, 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 of wearing masks, of showing parts of us, and therefore having a social life uh, in a way where something is in between us. And when Aaron talks in the lesson essay of the interest, the inter the between, yeah. it is so important that 
something has to between mm. has to be between persons mm. and then life is going on mm. so if there's nothing between persons there's no chance to meet only as she was saying in a great passion but then the world as such vanishes it's just the moment but this is something very very special the pa passion as a ultimate violence uh, actually Maybe, something yeah. that is could, could but, but yes but this is also something that we are living uh, at the moment so with so, the with the politics yeah. uh, state states of politics uh, uh, in today's world so i would say that the public thing is to show the special interest of mm. people mm. what mm. this could be but i might ask you then um, i happened to uh, hear and uh, listen to to jane fonda's recently and uh, jane fonda jane fonda yes yeah. a great uh, uh, human Actress. rights activist well she's a human rights activist and then just you as an actress and yeah good <laughs> thank you <laughs> Uh, no, no, it, uh, actually it's very controversial. My, I might even uh, read you all uh, this, uh, this part. She's uh, absolutely on the uh, left wing of American politics. Uh, she was against uh, the Vietnam War mm. and uh, fought a lot and even been condemned for treason. Uh, so uh, really on the left mm -hmm. uh, side of the specter in, in United States and she, she is, she was an uh, actress, so that's obvious. <laughs> uh, I, I, I was just so stunned and uh, happy to, uh, for the first time, to uh, read something which uh, can give us a clue. Uh, she was commenting Trump. And uh, she said at a moment, of course, I'm against him as a president, as a figure whatsoever. But she said, you have to have empathy for him. And I think that that has to also transfer to the people who voted for him. So that's the reason why I'm reading it. Mm -hmm. it, it because she's looking for a clue, trying to find mm -hmm. a way how we are going to reach those, mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. others. Yeah. Some of them, she says, you can't possibly persuade otherwise because they are white supremacists, you know? Or they are so far off the spectrum for their own traumatic reason, probably. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to uh, state here also. But there's a whole bunch of Trump voters who we have to open our hearts to and understand why they voted the way they did. Mm -hmm. so th th that's the something which uh, uh, puts us in this uh, effective realm, political realm, but uh, gives us also um, at least a try. Let's, let's try. What is it that we can uh, find uh, in deconstructing uh, the absolute other, this white supremacist who, who is like unreachable in his mm -hmm. truth, mm -hmm. because he has his truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is very important, I think, too. Um, we have in Germany at the time the same discussion. Yes, with the AfD. Uh, uh, yeah, and yeah. I remember Afde. one talk in our Jasper's house, we had a great guy, a very critical left wing guy, who had written a book. The, conser the conservative revolution and talked about the book, presented the book, and afterwards, mm. when he was finished with the discussion, and there was one guy standing up and talking, and he was from the AfD, mm -hmm. and it was so interesting to see that the author himself was so shocked. There's a real person, <laughs> so, and and he wasn't able to talk with him. He had just the enemy image, yeah? the AfD. And this is the point, it's not the point to say they're nice guys, and, but it's the respect for the person mm -hmm. and, the, and the openness to talk with him or her. And the author was just shocked. He had the right opinion, but he wasn't able to talk to this person. There's a real Avdila and he is talking clearly, yeah? Mm -hmm. 
what is wrong with him? And this was for me a, a very interesting experience. Excuse me, but so he was so paralyzed that he didn't talk at all? He talked with him, but he was shocked that, that this was a talkable person. And, and, and I could see that he never met the person. Yeah, he's in a kind of oasis where he thinks that and his ideas are like clear to him. And the point is, and the book never was, going to desert. And the book was written not in the way to understand the AfD, but written with a um, like the fraternalizing, written, yeah? Yeah, yeah, like a journal with a like when when he was describing how they meet, yeah, they meet. So 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 the way of style is. Uh, um, that you become critical in the first moment, yeah? And this is easy. Mm. You have black and white. But this is not the point. So I'm very thankful yes, that and you made this. Why, why I, I uh, quoted this? Because hypothetically, I was imagining what Hannah Arendt would have done uh, if she uh, is with us now. And the point she probably, she'll be... Uh, uh, out there to talk to them, to mm -hmm. discuss and to in investigate. But she did it very smart. She had many friends from many different rings in the society. Now we have many yeah. correspondence, correspondence which are published, yeah? Mm -hmm. And you can see people yeah. from the left, people from the right. Yeah. She always was meeting. Yeah. So she herself was a little bit like Max Weber. Max Weber wanted to know everybody. Yeah. Just to know what they do think. And I think Arndt was somehow, in this way, someone who was not limited to one perspective of left wing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and, but she was smart enough to hide it in the public. So many people didn't know that she knew this person too. Yeah? So I think yeah, because yeah. he knew how they would talk, how they would have talked about it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, but the openness to understand people with, with opinions I, I would not share yeah? um, is an important thing and, uh, and is relying on a certain strength of, of, of your person. Mm. Being able to hear and still say, I think differently. Yeah? And yeah, thank you. Uh, as the bells say, <laughs> yes, the church. <laughs> But uh, uh, Mark, I also wanted to uh, pose a question. Do you want to pose it still, or do you want to? Because we have yeah. one hour. Is this an open question? <laughs> it's an open, <laughs> open question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is. It's just a political yeah. question. Oh, it relates to equivalence. <laughs> Which... I, I haven't read the right paper, but I'm looking forward to reading it because I wasn't part of the seminar. But as you talked yesterday a lot about ambivalence and today as well, and about the necessity of you know, um, affirming ambivalence as a normal condition and even a virtue and creating a kind of a, a, a culture of acceptance of ambivalence and even like a political community where the expression of ambivalence and the sharing of ambivalence would be a positive thing. Mm -hmm. I was just reminded of um, an article that we recently discussed here in our reading group uh, by Wendy Brown about neoliberalism and in this article she she makes an interesting uh, analysis where she kind of um, views classical neoliberalism so Friedrich von Hayek and Milton Friedman on the one hand and right-wing populism as part of one single phenomenon which she considers to be um, uh, well, let's say ambivalent in one fundamental sense, namely uh, in the United States, let's say it's the most clear example, people who are on the right of the political spectrum are often simultaneously, let's say, uh, strong supporters of negative freedom in liberal terms and then of course also strong supporters of limiting negative freedom to other people to, to, to members of minorities or immigrants and so forth, right? So Wendy Brown argues that at the heart of what she terms, what she considers to be the neoliberal syndrome mm -hmm. lies this paradox or lies this ambivalence that people 
claim to be for freedom and at the same time are strongly in favor of limiting freedom. And I was just reminded that this could be an example of, of ambivalence. Now, what is at the, at the basis of this ambivalence? It seems to be some kind of an effective pre-understanding between people. And Randy Brown, of course, she has a, a little bit of a paternalistic analysis there. She says this is the resentment of you know disempowered white male middle class people who have been for decades let down by the system. Now they shared, and, and Europe is pretty much the same, let's say, with the rise of right-wing populism in Europe. It's this constituency which shares a certain effective pre-understanding and then uses ideas, as you said, in, pragmatic, in a pragmatic sense, but in a bad way, to rationalize contradictory statements, or contradictory, let's say, uh, normative claims. So I was, I was wondering, do we have criteria uh, for distinguishing ambivalence, Correct, ambivalence, and ambivalence as a result of an internal dialogue which is open yeah. and ambivalence as a justification for oppression resulting from some kind of, pre, you know, that, that's what I was wondering. I think uh, the comment you made were an example for how we can discern and have to discern, like what you were saying. Huh? It's Maybe that's the criterion. I mean, but then it's hard to say in public, you know, because people can start, can start, you know, claiming this is amb this ambivalence is authentic. It expresses some authentic. Yeah. I'm not sure because um, everything we say in public can be misunderstood. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very easy to misunderstand things, and we should be so free to say things in the public and then criticize people who misunderstand but still say it in public. Um, this is necessary because you cannot talk in public without the, the danger of misunderstanding. It's not possible. And the theory who would be um, clear enough to be not misunderstood, what could this be? Huh? I'm not sure. So I think this chance of a danger of misunderstanding we have to take. And, yeah, that's a good example. I think this could be a good closing point, huh? Yes, I think so, yes. Basically because uh, I think that we came to the, as I said, to the trial that I mentioned at the, the end of my presentation, but even now, whenever we want to say something in public, we are basically open for the trial, for being misunderstood yep. in this or that sense. Uh, well, thank you all very much. I hope that for you too this was uh, I love it. interesting. I mean, yes, really. Yeah. It was, a, I would say, one of the best seminars that I attended in this mm. room. So, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.